and welcome back to Bible Landscapes. In part three, we're going to be moving from our discussions on Enoch, um, only to mention uh, before we go to Abram in our discussion and reading that uh, uh, Enoch was mentioned, of course, by the writings of Paul in the New Testament. In very short, just to mention that Enoch was a man who walked with God and that he was translated, um, which is some good information. But one might wonder or be curiosity in a comparative study of the antiquities and characters of the very ancient times, why uh, more wasn't devoted to the life of Enoch in the writing of the pages of the canon, the Holy Bible as we know it. Well, the answer is very simple. They had all the information uh, that was contained in those days, uh, in the New Testament times especially, uh, of Enoch that was of any real significance already in present access of scrolls and histories. Those have been lost for the most part. But in their day, <clears throat> a lot of uh, the information about Enoch was assumed knowledge, so they didn't write about it. Uh, they focused on the gospel message of the New Covenant, New Testament of Jesus Christ, assuming uh, the general knowledge uh, concerning Enoch. Uh, we know this from the fragments of the books, uh, scrolls, that is, that were found in the uh, Qumran uh, caves of better known as the Dead Sea Scrolls discoveries, that the information about Enoch in those days was readily available from those scrolls. They would not have been kept within the treasured hiding of the other scrolls, such as the books of Isaiah and others, uh, had they not been considered by the priests to be significant and legitimate history. That's important to note. Because you're going to run into all types of uh, opinions concerning the books of Enoch. Now, the only problem <clears throat> that we have with the modern translations of Enoch is that they are pretty far removed as far as the original copies of copies of copies in the days of the times of the apostles. And in the few hundred year period time before that, uh, back in the Old Testament, when they originally, uh, during one period of time there, hid the scrolls within the Qumran caves, etc. Hopefully there will be more significant discoveries. But the point is, is that when you really do an, a comparative historical examination of what is available, and I, I, can't, I can't emphasize enough how valuable these treasures are, of ancient times, considering the miracle of their preservation, actually, uh, that uh, the, the book of Enoch as a whole, parts of it definitely uh, have legitimacy. Uh, I, I am determined in that. Uh, hopefully in your own uh, extra biblical studies that you will qualify certain histories on your own as I have qualified uh, the books of Enoch as being very valuable and in some parts uh, intact enough, in other words, historically accurate enough to place stock in the information. And I believe there is a high level percentage of degree of legitimacy uh, in the current translation uh, that uh, some of us use in our writing. So I'm, I'm going to move on now. I'm going to introduce the character of Abram as it is written. Uh, first off, we'll start off. There are other ancient writings, but there's quite a bit said about it in the book of Jasher. First off, <clears throat> this is an extra biblical uh, supplemental study in reading. And uh, I'm going to qualify my source first off from the Bible itself. Joshua uh, in chapter 10, verse 13 and the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies, 
Is not this written in the book of Jasher? That is a question. Now see, uh, the Bible itself in the book of Joshua is given legitimacy to the book of Jasher. As though it is saying, doesn't even the book of Jasher say this? Or have, have this written in? Another place in the Old Testament is Second Samuel 1 and 18 that gives validity to the book of Jasher. In reading Second Samuel 118, also he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher, even giving more credence and endorsement to the book of Jasher in the way this is written. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. So the Bible in two places definitely recognizes the legitimacy of the book of Jasher. Now we use the term Jasher uh, from the Hebrew translations. It, it has different meaning, such as the just man, things like that. But it's basically a history collection. So we're going to go to that history collection now, kept down through the generations of the Hebrew and Jewish people. <clears throat> And we'll only go about 10 minutes with each one of these parts, and we'll break it out into parts uh, to allow you to interrupt, etc. We're going to start our reading in Jasher back, actually, at the time of Nimrod's birth. And we're going to move into the story of Abram's birth, according to the history of Jasher. All right. <clears throat> and Cush, the son of Ham, the son of Noah, took a wife in those days in his old age, and she bare a son, and they called his name Nimrod, saying, At that time the sons of men again began to rebel and transgress against God. And the child grew up, and his father loved him exceedingly, for he was the son of his old age. And the garments of skin which God made for Adam and his wife Eve when they went out of the garden, were given to Cush. And after the death of Adam and his wife, the garments were given to Enoch, the son of Jared. And when Enoch was taken up to God, he gave them to Methuselah, his son. And at the death of Methuselah, Noah took them and brought them to the ark. And they were with him until he went out of the ark. And in their going out, Ham stole those garments from Noah, his father, and he took them and hid them from his brothers. And when Ham begot his first son, Cush, he gave the garments in secret, and they were with Cush many days. And Cush also concealed them from his sons and brothers. And when Cush had begotten Nimrod, he gave, them those, he gave him those garments through his love for him. And Nimrod grew up, and when he was twenty years old, he put on those garments. Nimrod given the ancient garments <clears throat> by his father. And Nimrod became strong when he put on the garments, and God gave him might and strength. And he was a mighty hunter in the earth. Yea, he was a mighty hunter in the field. And he hunted the animals, and he built altars, and he offered upon them the animals before the Lord. And Nimrod strengthened himself, and he rose up from amongst his brethren, and he fought the battles of his brethren against all their enemies round about. And the Lord delivered all the enemies of his brethren in his hands. And God prospered him from time to time, in his battles, and he reigned over earth, reigned upon the earth. <clears throat> Therefore, it, correction, it actually says he reigned upon the earth, not over the earth. Therefore, it came current in those days when a man ushered forth those that he had trained up for battle, he would say to them, like God did to Nimrod, who was mighty, a hunter in the earth, and who succeeded in battles that prevailed against his brethren, that he delivered them <coughs> from the hands of their enemies. Excuse me. So may God strengthen us and deliver us this day. Uh, 
<clears throat> and when Nimrod was 40 years old, at that time there was war between his brethren and the children of Japheth, so that they were in the power of their enemies. And the Nimrod went forth at that time, and he assembled all the sons of Cush and their families, about four hundred and sixty men. And he hired also from some of his friends and acquaintances about eighty men, and he gave them their hire. And he went with them to battle. And when he was upon the road, Nimrod strengthened the hearts of the people that went with him. We'll continue this uh, in part four of Bible Landscapes. Come back and be with us.